The sermon title this morning is Wrong Plan, Wrong Time, Wrong Choice. Wrong plan, wrong time, wrong choice. And we're approaching this section of scripture now that begins with John chapter 7 and verses 1 through 13. And uh, on the heels now of John chapter 6 and the great apostasy or the great departure as we discussed. And as we have studied the gospel so far together, we've seen several themes now that have been presented by John the evangelist uh, to us so that he might to us reveal the Lord Jesus Christ. Those hearing the gospel, having the Lord Jesus Christ revealed to them might believe in him for everlasting life. As we started the gospel together, we began with a prologue in John chapter 1. And if you remember, John chapter 1 provides for us a stark contrast between this wicked, sinful, and depraved world and the Lord Jesus Christ and who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And if you remember that, we've heard from the beginning, Jesus is the word of God. He's the word of God who was with God and is God. He was in the beginning with God. He made the world. And yet this world, in stark contrast, did not receive him. He became flesh. He dwelt among us. And yet they would murder him to take him out of the world. He is the light of the world. And yet this dark world, it says there, cannot comprehend him. And because the world cannot comprehend him, this world hates him. John 1 presents a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as this world being ignorant of him, ignorant of God's plans, ignorant of God's works, and because their fallen hearts and fallen minds are set upon the things of the earth and not on the things above, they do not know him. Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, If then you were raised with Christ... Seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Paul charges, set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We have to be reminded that we're not our own. We were bought with a price. We're to set our mind on things which are above where Christ is. We often, as Christians, don't we, need a shift in our priorities. If you're here today, you've never put faith in Christ, you've never turned from your sin, you need a shift in your heart, you need a shift in your mind, you need a shift in your thinking, you need an entire new body makeover, so to speak. You need to have your heart made over, made new. We, even as Christians, we need a continual renewing of our minds to set our minds on things which are above. In the scriptures, and particularly here in John, we see a perfect example of the heavenly mindedness that we're to have in the Lord Jesus Christ in his life, in his work. His mind constantly and consistently set on things above, always thinking, always teaching from a spiritual perspective, speaking not on his own authority and always doing the will of the Father who sent him, always heading where God wants him to go, always at work to accomplish the mission that God has given him to accomplish and always done at the time at which God wants him to do it, just perfectly following the will of God always moving ahead to finish the work that the Father has given him to complete. With all of that in mind, constantly heart, mind, sight on his appointed hour in Jerusalem. His priorities always in perfect focus. And so the contrast then is set before us. We have the contrast between this dead world and the Lord Jesus Christ. The glorious splendor of the diamond against the black backdrop, right? The brilliant star against the black sky. In other words here, the brilliance, the majesty, the excellency of Jesus Christ offset against the wickedness of this unbelieving world. The Lord perfectly doing the will of the Father, pressing on, accomplishing his work, teaching spiritual truth, right? Preaching the kingdom of God. And then this fallen world, unable to discern anything spiritual, pressing on in their ignorance, pressing on in their earthly mindedness, pressing on in their worldliness, in their godlessness, in their self-interest, ultimately pressing on in unbelief. And so far in the Gospel of John, as we've walked through these chapters, we've seen many examples of this, many examples of unbelief, and that unbelief displayed in worldliness, in earthly mindedness, in worldly thinking, in ignorance. If you remember, John the Baptist bore witness of him in the wilderness. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
faithfully, in John, John's ministry, faithfully pointing everyone that he spoke to, everyone within the sound of his voice, pointing them to Christ, pointing them to the Lord. And yet there, there were many at that time that just continued to follow John around. Despite John's ministry, John, not by his own will, but kept garnering disciples to himself. He was pointing people to Christ and the people were following him. They were even envious of Jesus and his disciples. Their club's bigger than our club, right? In chapter three, after having to testify, John testifying, listen, I am not the Christ. He admits a few verses later that no one receives his testimony. Or remember in John chapter two, when the Lord turned water into wine at the wedding at Cana, those servants there at the wedding saw the same miracle that the disciples saw and had a different response. And listen, it's not enough to say, wow, what a miracle. It's not enough. God is sovereignly at work behind that miracle to point to Christ, to reveal him as the Christ, the son of God, that believing in him, we might have life in his name. Or in John chapter two, when those at the Passover in Jerusalem saw the many miracles that he did, Jesus Christ cleared the temple with his own authority cleared the temple of those who bought and sold and exchanged money there wickedly, many of them simply looking on in ignorance. The people saw miracles. They believed in him, so to speak, but did not put their faith in him. Jesus knew exactly what was in their unbelieving and worldly heart. Or think about Nicodemus. Nicodemus in John chapter three, the teacher of Israel, and yet Nicodemus comes and couldn't understand spiritual things. Simply could not think from a spiritual perspective. The Lord Jesus Christ had to respond, listen, I'm teaching you earthly things. How are you gonna believe if I teach you heavenly things? Nicodemus just simply earthly minded, worldly in his reason, using human logic. We just saw a staggering example of unbelief in John chapter six. When after performing an astounding miracle feeding upwards of 20,000 people, the feeding of the 5,000 men there around the Sea of Galilee, many went back and followed him no more. We'll see it even more glaringly obvious now as we work from John chapter seven through the end of the gospel. As we're presented in the gospel of John with an astounding revelation, staggering evidence as to who the Lord Jesus Christ is, we are also at the same time presented with astounding, staggering accounts of unbelief, of worldly thinking, earthly mindedness. And again, we're just reminded from John chapter one, this world doesn't know him, it doesn't comprehend him, and it doesn't receive him. And just like people today, when you try to share the gospel with them, sometimes that Failure to comprehend him is expressed in plain spoken rejection. Other times it's just out and out hostility, out and out hate. We're gonna see that as we work through John 7. Now follow me for a moment. There are two basic reasons why John writes this gospel. One, to reveal Jesus as the Christ, the son of God. Two, there's an evangelistic purpose that those who see him, believe in him as the Christ, the Son of God, might have life in his name. To reveal Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, and two, to bring people to believe in him for eternal life. But now, in the context of accomplishing that mission, in the context of revealing Christ for who he is, with the end that we might believe, John, at the same time, also frequently shows us the earthly mightiness, the worldliness, the ignorance, the hostility the plain unbelief of those that do not believe. And sometimes we even see the disciples, true disciples, struggling with some of this as well. We have to remember in that, that these things were written for our admonition. They're written for our example. The point is of this and other passages like it is, listen, don't be unbelieving like they are. Don't respond with unbelief, with ignorance, with worldliness, with earthly mindedness like they do. Don't follow their example. Don't be earthly minded as they are. Don't be ignorant as they are. And consider this, consider the absurdity of their response of earthly mindedness, rejection, hostility. Consider the absurdity of that in light of who they are rejecting. Here, when John presents Christ in 
technicolor splendor, so to speak. Consider who you are rejecting. Don't respond as they did. John doesn't have to say here, these people are foolish unbelievers. Don't respond like they do. It's, it's obvious from the account. Don't respond as they do. You can see it for yourself. And in all of this, this should challenge your heart, should challenge your thinking. If you're here today and you've never turned from your sin, you've never put saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're still living your life for yourself, living it up until you're gonna die and go to hell, don't be unbelieving. It should challenge your unbelief. So as we come here to John chapter seven, John's writing with the same twofold purpose, to reveal Jesus as the Christ and then to bring people to believe in him for eternal life. So in revealing Christ as the Messiah, in John chapter 7, we're going to see great themes like the sovereignty of God, the providence of God expressed in his perfect timing for the Lord Jesus Christ to go up to the feast. We're going to see Jesus perfectly waiting on the plan of God, perfectly doing the will of the Father, boldly and authoritatively confronting those who stand in opposition to him. Again, with his mind ever set on his ultimate mission in Jerusalem, the purpose for which he has come into the world. But now as we work through the chapter, at the same time, we're also going to see these glorious themes intentionally offset against the fact that even his brothers here don't believe in him. We're going to see the ignorance of the crowd, the hostility of the Jewish opposition. Now, in John chapter 7 through about John chapter 12, continuing to ramp up against him. We're going to see the appalling lack of faith. And eventually, we're going to see him betrayed by one of his closest and crucified. So as we can see up to this point, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is having an impact. There are a few, though, that come to him in genuine repentance and faith. They simply won't set their mind on things above. They have their mind stuck in this world. What about you this morning? What impact so far is John's gospel having on you, on your thinking, on where your heart is? Would you consider this morning that you're worldly? or that you're earthly minded, how do you know? What does that look like? Maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith in Christ, you're lost, you're lost. And this morning you're on your way to hell. There's a judgment that is hanging over your head. John says you are condemned already. The point of this passage this morning is to say to you, don't be unbelieving as they are. Don't respond the way they do, don't be unbelieving. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian, and you're a Christian, the point of this passage to you is don't be unbelieving as they are. Put your faith in Christ, walk in faith. Worldly mindedness, earthly mindedness, basically is thinking and living as if there is no God. You basically think, you walk through your day-to-day life, you live as if there is no God. It's a devotion to earthly things rather than a devotion to spiritual things. You look And you think like you're a citizen of this world, not like you're a citizen of heaven. In Romans chapter 8, verse 5, Paul explains, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. It's your mind this morning set on the things of the flesh. Where's your heart? In other words, stop allowing your flesh. Stop allowing the world, the devil, to dictate your priorities and plans. Stop allowing the world to dictate your thinking. Paul tells the Philippians in chapter 3, in verse 19, that those who set their minds on earthly things are enemies of the cross of Christ. Their God is their belly. In other words, their God is their appetites, their lusts, their desires. Their end is destruction. They cannot understand spiritual realities. Don't be unbelieving as they are. Set your mind, set your heart on Christ. Set your heart on things above. In John chapter seven, verses one through 13, we're gonna see tragic unbelief exhibited in our narrative in three ways. One, wrong plan. Two, wrong time. Three, wrong choice. So let's look first at the wrong plan, verses one through five. In John chapter seven, verse one, the Bible reads, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. For he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews there sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand and his brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. 
For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. So verse one now says, after these things, we begin here on the heels of the account in John chapter six. And after the events of John chapter six, here we have a marker in verse two of the timing of where we're at. And that's the Jewish feast of tabernacles there. We know based on the calendar, the Jewish the calendar, that the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, the ingathering, took place about six months after the events in John chapter six, the feeding of the 5,000. So it's after these things about six months later. And here, this is the end of the Lord's Galilean ministry. He's gonna be coming out of Galilee soon and it'll be the last time that he goes there. Won't go back to Galilee. And we saw at the end here of his ministry in John chapter six, Many of his disciples, it says there, left him and walked with him no more. Isn't it the grace and mercy of God here in verse one that Jesus here doesn't stop walking? That word there for walked means he continued walking around Galilee. In other words, he didn't go hiding off in a corner somewhere. He didn't camp out in a home to wait it out until he went to Jerusalem. The Lord here is still about his ministry still about his people. He's out accomplishing the mission. He doesn't stop walking. So still among the people, still doing the work that he gave, that the Lord gave him to do. That's a good example for us. If there's difficulty, you keep walking, just like the Lord did. When trial comes, you keep walking. When everyone else seems to fall away around you, like those disciples in Capernaum that day, you keep walking. You just keep serving the Lord. You keep obeying him. You don't stop. But one of the reasons that he stayed here in Galilee was that it became too dangerous for him to move around freely in Jerusalem, in Judea. It says there that the Jews sought to kill him. That phrase, again, the Jews, is a reminder of that opposition that is at work against Christ. And it's not the people, it's distinguished from the crowd. These are those Jewish authorities, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, those that were against him. And if you turn back just a couple of pages, we came across an example of this back in John chapter five. And look down at John chapter five at verse 16. Here the Lord's in Jerusalem. And he's healing a lame man on the Sabbath and he comes in contact with this exact same group. Look at verse 16. It says there, for this reason, the Jews, it's the same group, persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him. Why? Because he had done these things on the Sabbath and Jesus answered them. My father's been working until now and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him now because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So this hostility that started in John chapter five, actually started before that, is now continuing to expand. It's a larger group now and it's ramping up. It's just getting that much more uh, harsh against him. Now think about this for a moment. There are a lot of people in looking at this passage that then accuse the Lord Jesus Christ of cowardice here or fear. Why wouldn't the Lord go into Judea? Because he was scared that something was gonna happen to him there. That's not what is going on in this passage. This is a great example here of the Lord not willfully putting himself in danger. In other words, you don't intentionally go seeking after it. You don't seek after persecution, you flee persecution. The Lord here is not willing to die. The purpose for which he came to the world is to die. So he's not here fearful of dying. It's not the right time. It's not the right time. And so the Lord, again, considering the Father's will, considering the Father's plan for him, doesn't head into Judea too soon, where the Jews there are actively seeking to kill him. And two, it's just not the time to go. His appointment with Jerusalem is later. And so it would have been the wrong plan to head into Judea at that time. John Calvin wrote this. He said, although Christ avoided dangers, he did not turn aside a hair's breadth from the course of his duty. The Lord would have obeyed the father to his death and did. But now one of our markers for time is this Feast of Tabernacles we see in verse two. This was, this Feast of Tabernacles, it's also called the Feast of Booths or the Ingathering, was a feast of thanksgiving. Originally, the thanksgiving was for the harvest. And so in Jerusalem and Israel, the land, you would have had a harvest in April through June for grain, but then there would have been a harvest in September, October for um, grapes and olives. So this feast came at the end of the year, near the end of September into early October. 
And this was to celebrate the harvest, thank the Lord for the harvest. Now, it was called the Feast of Tabernacles or called the Feast of Booths because originally in Leviticus chapter 23 or in Deuteronomy chapter 16, the Lord instituted the feast for the people of Israel to commemorate God's deliverance, to celebrate God and God's delivering them out of bondage in Egypt. And when he brought them out into the wilderness, they were said to live in these booths that were made of palm branches, you know, of tree limbs, these makeshift lean-tos, if you will, that the people of Israel lived in. And so when they would come to the festival in Jerusalem, it was a pilgrimage festival, and so all men were required to come yearly to this festival, they would, for the eight days that they were there, they would have lived in these makeshift lean-tos made with palm branches and leaves and tree limbs. If you were a city dweller and you lived in Jerusalem, you would have made one of these booths or tabernacles, and for that eight days, you would have stayed in that booth, that tabernacle, while the festival was going on. So it was a great equalizer, right? Rural from out in the country, rich, poor in the city, everyone... One commentator said it was like the discomfort and merriment of a picnic. You know, it was uncomfortable, but a joyous time of celebration, celebrating the Lord. Now, what's the significance here? As the Jewish people, as the Israelites practiced faithfully the Feast of the Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, it became a reference to God's blessing on the people in his presence with them in the original tabernacle, in the wilderness, in the original booth in which God was said to have dwelt. So the people of Israel began to view it as the blessing of God's presence among them. Now think about the significance of that here for a moment. God first displayed his presence to them in the tabernacle. Then he displays his presence to them in the temple that replaced the tabernacle. And here in Jerusalem, at this time, you have the Feast of Tabernacles celebrating the presence of God when no more perfectly and no more fully could the presence of God ever be displayed than in the perfections of the Lord Jesus Christ walking among them at that time as the Messiah. And yet they completely missed it. They completely missed it. We'll go forward a few verses in John chapter 7. There are going to be people debating on whether this is the Christ because, that, because he comes out of Galilee. They say, isn't the Messiah supposed to come out of Bethlehem? Five minutes worth of research would have cleared that up. This is the Messiah. And yet they missed him and they missed him because they were willfully ignorant. They did not comprehend him. They missed him because they were worldly minded, caught up in the idea that Jesus Christ is going to come back as a conquering king. And so when he comes back as a suffering servant, they miss it. They miss their Messiah. Now think about it for a moment. God no longer indwells tabernacles. He no longer indwells the temple. Where does God dwell today? In the hearts of his believers, in the hearts of his people, by faith. Don't miss it. Think about that. God indwelling the hearts of his people. Look at the changed lives. Look at what the power of the gospel to transform a wicked sinner into a child of God. It's staggering. It is astounding evidence. I grew up in churches, false churches, preaching a false gospel. I don't think I ever saw a saved person. But when I walked through the doors of this church for the first time and I saw the spirit of God at work in his people, I was struck was an astounding example to me. And that's what a Christian looks like. That's how a Christian loves. That's how a Christian serves the Lord. That's how a Christian fellowships with other people. That's how, that's what a Christian looks like. Don't miss it. That's the power of God in the gospel to transform a heart. And just like these at this time, if you miss that, you may miss the gospel. Cry out to God. There's power in the gospel. God will change your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ, his spirit will be at work in you. He'll cleanse you from all your filthiness. He'll turn you from all your idols. He'll give you a heart of flesh and he'll cause you to obey him in joy from the heart. That's the power. And so many today, listen, so many today want to strip the gospel of its power to change. And if all you do is just walk an aisle, say a prayer, make a decision, well, that may be all you're going to get. No change at all. And you walk away placating your guilty conscience. There's power in the gospel. And here... Don't miss it. Don't respond as they did. Don't be unbelieving, unbelieving as they are. 
Set your mind on things above and behold the power of God. Believers. So we come to verse three. We see that in addition to the Jewish opposition here and in addition to all those that turned away from him in John chapter six, even his own brothers don't believe him. Even his own brothers don't believe him. Look at verse three. His brothers therefore said to him, depart from here, go into Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. Now, opposed to what the Catholic church teaches, these are here the other sons of Mary and Joseph. They're actual physical offspring of Mary and Joseph. These are his, all his younger brothers. Matthew 13 even gives their names. They're James, Joseph, Simon, and Jude. Now his brothers, although they don't believe at this time, his brothers would eventually come to believe in him. Two of them wrote epistles, James and Jude, right? And James became eventually the leader of the church in Jerusalem. But here in John chapter seven, they've got their own ideas about the way that his ministry should run. Got their own ideas about what he's supposed to do. In fact, all of that is generated because they are spiritually blind. They're earthly minded. They're worldly. They don't have their mind set on things above. They have their mind set on the things of this earth. And so they're telling him here what, what to do. And it's clear from their reasoning, they have fallen human minds, fallen human hearts. His brothers were basically telling him, listen, Jesus, go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the biggest possible stage on which to you, for you to display what you're doing. Uh, it's during one of the biggest events. The Festival of Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles, was the most popular feast of the year. It's during one of the biggest events. Jesus, you go up to Jerusalem where the capital is, where all the action is taking place and you display yourself before the world. Let them know you are the Messiah. In other words, give them a sign. <laughs> and after chapter, after chapter, after chapter, how many times have we seen this wicked generation asking for a sign? Always asking for a sign. And here his brothers are telling him to do the very same thing. They might have been disheartened by the results that they saw in Galilee and Jesus coming out of Galilee basically with no one but the 12 around him. Or they were thinking about Jesus as a conquering Messiah, like others had thought of him. Whatever the case, they were thinking to themselves, is something going to happen? It's going to happen in Jerusalem. And that's right. Eventually, there will come a time when the Lord Jesus Christ will go into Jerusalem. When that time comes, the time will be right. That's his appointed hour at the cross. But the time is not right at this point. Certainly, they thought things were not going to happen in Galilee. Besides, listen to verse 4. Besides, no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. In other words, if you're claiming to be the Messiah, then you have to make yourself known publicly. You know, just on a side note, uh, there's a false dichotomy there, a false separation between things that are good and righteous and holy and just and known and public and seen. There's a, a false dichotomy between that which is glorious and that which should be seen or known. I tell you, there are faithful, godly, loving brothers and sisters who just faithfully serve the Lord day in and day out and no one knows anything about it. So it's just a false, it's again, worldly thinking, earthly minded thinking that glory comes from being known publicly just not the case here. And the Lord Jesus Christ isn't going to give it one minute of notice. He says, basically, get yourself, your brother, the brothers say, get yourself to the authorities in Jerusalem. There's something else here, though, at the end of verse four that I want you to see. A.W. Pink here calls it a slightly veiled taunt. Look at that last sentence. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. In other words, if you are who you claim to be, if your works are genuine, then get out of the sticks here in Galilee, get yourself up to Jerusalem, get yourself up to the capital and let them test your claims. Now, let me ask you, what does it sound like? At the end of verse four there, what does it sound like when he says, if you, Jesus, if you, sounds like Satan, that's right. Sounds like Satan at his temptations. If you command these stones to be turned to bread, right? If you throw yourself off the pinnacle of the, the temple, Sounds like Satan. You almost expect here at the end of this verse, a get behind me Satan a response from the Lord Jesus Christ. Sounds like Satan. This is a taunt. This is a challenge. Now don't miss this. It's the, in the language, you can miss it. This is utterly 
contemptuously disrespectful of the Lord. This is, it had a tone to it. Even that challenge at the end of verse four, there's just a tone to it. The only way that you can explain how they talk to him with disrespect, right? With ignorance, but at the same time, indignant, um, just spitefully speaking to the Lord, their own worldly thinking, their own ignorance. The only way that you can explain that is verse five, for even his brothers did not believe in him. It's the only way to explain the way that they spoke to him. They didn't bother to ask him. He's claiming to be the Messiah. He claims to come from God, and yet they're going to tell him how it's going to be. Even his brothers didn't believe him. You know, there's a messianic psalm, Psalm 69. And in verse 8, Psalm 69, verse 8 says, I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. It's a messianic psalm, several messianic prophecies there. And one of those, this, that he's going to become a stranger to his brothers. On the part of the brothers here, this is a wicked plan. This is a wicked plan. It's a worldly plan. Altogether, it is the wrong plan. Wrong plan. They challenged him. They insulted him. They disrespected him. They completely failed to consider anything to do with his wishes, his plan. So prideful, so self-willed. No consideration whatsoever given to seek the Lord's direction. They didn't ask him his opinion. And these are guys that grew up in the same household with him. (laughs) So they, they were in this world. They were of this world. Bathing in the world's reasoning, bathing in earthly mindedness, completely ignorant of God's plans and the mission that Christ came to accomplish. And all of that, a product of a worldly depraved heart, a depraved mind, depraved logic. So what's the purpose? What's the point in displaying this in John chapter seven? Don't be earthly minded as they are. Don't be unbelieving as they are. Don't be worldly like they are. Don't be worldly in your thinking. Don't be worldly or unbelieving in your service to the Lord. Your plans, apart from the Lord, are meaningless. Man can make his plans, but what? The Lord directs his steps. So seek the Lord. You may say, I'm going to go into this town or that town and make a profit. When you should have asked, what would the Lord have me do? There are many today who follow that same path. Think about the preachers, the churches, the people that compromise the gospel to draw a crowd. They compromise the truth of God's word to make a paycheck, to get wealthy. Think about the preachers who compromise God's word to get famous. Saw the other day, Creflo Dollar wanting a $65 million jet. Give me a break. All of them, it says in Ezekiel, are false teachers because every one of them are given to covetousness. False shepherds that will be judged by God. What about this? They abandon the methods taught in the Bible because they want to come up with their own culturally accepted methods. Like, don't just share the gospel with someone. You can't cram it down their throat. Get to know them for a couple of years first. Right? Have them to a barbecue. Give them a beer. (laughs) Let them get to know you and then share the gospel. False methods, that's twisting scripture. That's not trusting God for results and following God's plans. That is man's reasoning, wicked human logic. They're going to hell, give them the gospel. Or they twist scripture so that a woman can be a pastor. Or they twist scripture so that it's fine to get an abortion. You know that's increasing among evangelicals? The notion that it's okay with God to have an abortion? They twist scripture so that evolution isn't godless. Or they twist scripture so that it's perfectly fine to be a gay Christian. What about on a personal level? You and I, we need to guard ourselves against this. You may think to yourself, listen, I'm going to take that job. Move to that side of town. I'll worry about church later. (laughs) Worldly thinking, earthly mindedness. Besides, God's going to be okay with it. That extra money is going to help me provide for my family better. Is that what God would have you do? I'm too busy to go evangelizing. Besides, I'm evangelizing my kids at home. (laughs) Or you don't have to be a, or you don't have to go to small group to be a Christian. (laughs) It's like you hear some of these things and listen, don't think legalistically about that. What I'm saying is not legalistic. These things come out of the heart and their excuses. This is just a minor lapse into apathy. I'll get out of it eventually. Besides, I'm a Christian. My prayer life is fine. I pray on and off. (laughs) My Christian life is just fine. I go to church every Sunday. Is that what it means to be a Christian? 
I'm just too busy to have time in my Bible. I'll read it when I can. <laughs> Is that what the Christian life looks like? Examine yourself according to God's word. What happens? What happens when the word of God isn't reigning and prevailing in your heart and mind? Now think about it for a moment. With this world, your flesh, and the devil against you, what happens to you when the word of God isn't reigning and prevailing in your heart? I'm talking about Christians. If you're lost, you have no hope, you need to turn to Christ and get saved. Turn from your sin and be saved. But if you're a Christian, you have the spirit of God in you, what happens when the word of God isn't prevailing in your heart and mind? You fall into sin. You fall into sin. Your faithfulness to God goes out the window. Your fruitfulness for God goes out the window. Why? Because you're grieving the Holy Spirit in your sin. Your sanctification comes to a screeching halt. Your disobedience halts every conformity the Lord might have in you to Christ. It's just your sanctification, your Christian life comes to a halt. Are you worldly? Are you earthly minded? Is the word of God having rule and reign in your heart by his spirit? Examine yourselves. This is a good test to take. When we talk about heaven, when we talk about heaven, what comes to your mind? What comes to your mind? You think of heaven. Is it, wow, no more pain? No more pain, no more tears, no more worry. Think of all the golf I'm gonna get in, right? Um, don't have to worry about working that lousy job anymore. You know, that's earthly minded. It's all entirely focused on you. When a genuine Christian informed by the word of God and dwelt by his spirit thinks about heaven, what do you think about? Christ. Serving Christ, loving Christ, worshiping Christ free from sin. The glories and excellencies of Christ. Worshiping and praising him for all eternity with the innumerable number of saints in heaven. Worshiping God free from sin with the angels in heaven. The glories and majesties and excellencies of Christ. And pleasures forevermore. <laughs> and joy. Does that sound mundane to you? If it sounds mundane to you, then you're earthly minded, you're worldly. You notice how our perception of heaven, one can be entirely focused on you, earthly mindedness, or the other can be entirely focused on Christ. You know, uh, a fish, a fish can swim through water its entire lifetime and never wear itself out. But you put a man in the water and within moments, he can wear himself out, right? A man is of the world, not of the water. <laughs> but are you of the world and not of the spirit? The spiritual things bore you. Are they burdensome to you? Are they mundane to you? An earthly minded person will wear themselves out complaining over the least of spiritual duties. The Bible says do this and you're like, <laughs> right? Because you're of the world. You're not in the spirit how little difficulties seem to constantly discourage them. Every molehill is a mountain. The things of God just aren't as sweet as they once were. That's a good test. If you turn from your sin, put your faith in Christ, and you set out, and the things of God are so sweet to you, so precious to you, if today they are less sweet, less precious, then you have succumbed to worldly mindedness. You are turning back to the things of this earth. You don't have your mind and heart set in God's word and therefore set on the things above. It's just worldliness. Back in John chapter seven, the brothers of Jesus here, worldly. They've got the wrong plan. And because out of the overflow of their heart, the mouth speaks, they're giving him terrible advice here. But in addition to being the wrong plan, here it's also just the wrong time. Wrong time in verse six. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not yet going up to the feast for my time has not yet fully come. When he said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. Jesus was certainly not going to follow their plan for him. His will, his joy, his daily food, as he once said, is to do the will of the Father. 
But he's also here not going to follow their timetable. And again, in contrast, we're reminded that God sovereignly orchestrates all things to happen according to his plan, according to his decree, and according to his timetable. And it's simply not the time yet for Jesus Christ to head into Judea. And his brothers weren't going to get him off track. Now, in contrast to that, if you look at verse 6, in contrast to that, the brothers being lost having their minds set on the things of the earth, not considering the things above, really have no concept of God's providence. They really have no concept of God's timetable. And so to them, one time to go up to the feast is just as good as any other time to go up to the feast. It's inconsequential to them. So their time is always ready. It simply, to them, didn't matter. They didn't have to be concerned here with the persecution that the Lord had to be concerned with. And then he explains that, Jesus explains that by saying, it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. In other words, the brothers, you're in the world and you're of the world. And the world loves its own, you love the world. The Lord Jesus Christ is in the world, not of the world. And because he testifies of it, that its works are evil, the world is hostile towards him and hostility expressed in hatred. And listen, if you're of the world, then the world is gonna love you too and you're gonna love the world, and there won't be any hostility towards you or hatred towards you. But the Bible says, 2 Timothy 3, 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If you're in the world but not of the world, then you as Christ will testify of it that its works are evil. That's called bringing a law of God and evangelism. And it's gonna hate you too. Sinners don't like to be rebuked for their sin. And that displeasure with the rebuke expresses itself in hatred. They're gonna hate you too, just like they hated Christ. Hate is the inevitable result. But you have to bring the good news. You give them the bad news, and you bring the good news. And the Lord will save through the gospel. So he tells his brothers then to go up to the feast in verse eight and to go up without him. He's not gonna go because the time is not right. Verse eight you go up to the feast. I'm not yet going up to the feast for my time has not yet fully come. Going up in the beginning of the feast would have put Jesus Christ right in the middle of the, the caravan heading up to Jerusalem, right in the middle of all the people, would have made him extremely obvious going into Jerusalem to those seeking to kill him. So it just wasn't the right time. And besides, the Lord Jesus Christ is not following their program to display himself to the world. All the timing is not right here. It's the wrong time. He has an appointed time in Jerusalem. That time hasn't come yet for him. It would come at exactly the right time that God ordains. So Jesus here decided he would not go with them in the way and at the time that they asked him to. That doesn't mean, doesn't mean that the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't going to go at all. There are many who read this passage who believe here that the Lord is fickle. <laughs> he can't make up his mind. I'm not going to go. And then he goes. Listen, it's exactly the opposite. The Lord Jesus Christ has resolved and determined in his heart and mind that he's going to do exactly what the Father wants him to do and at the time that the Father wants him to do it. This isn't fickle here. This is the Lord Jesus Christ waiting on the Father, waiting on the plan, so to speak. And so in verse nine, when he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. It's a reminder for us too, with the example of the Lord, don't push, don't rush. You get an offer. It looks like an offer you can't refuse. Seek the Lord. There are many examples. When Joshua and the Israelites failed to seek the Lord before going into battle against Ai, they lost that battle, lost the lives of 36 of their men, and Israel was defeated. And then they're on their face crying. Why did it happen, right? They didn't seek the Lord ahead of time. Or when Joshua, the Israelites, made a Gibeonite treaty, that False treaty, that wicked treaty with the Gibeonites because they didn't seek the Lord ahead of time. How many times have you gotten yourself into hot water because you didn't simply wait on the Lord and seek him before making a decision? You're not your own. <laughs> Those decisions are to come from the Lord. Wait on the Lord, pray, seek the Lord. Read the Bible, make sure that what you're doing is biblical. Don't rush ahead. Psalm 1 says, blessed Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Don't be worldly-minded as they are. 
Don't just take that wicked counsel. Seek the Lord. But thirdly, it's the wrong plan. It's the wrong time. Third, it's the wrong choice. So many wrong choices. Look at verse 10. When his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, not as they intended for him, but as it were in secret. In other words, he went up incognito, right? Not trying to draw attention to himself, but he was going to Jerusalem. Now his brothers here did the natural thing, the worldly thing. Here is their brother Jesus. He is claiming to be the Messiah and he's backing it up with all kinds of evidence, irrefutable, irrefutable evidence. And so what do the brothers do? They leave the Lord Jesus Christ behind and go up to a festival, go up to a feast. You know, as many people do that every single week. They depart from the Lord Jesus Christ in their hearts and their minds and they follow their ritual, follow their religious ritual. Um, we need Christ, choose Christ. So it's a wrong choice. Stay with Christ, worship Christ, praise him, serve him. It's a wrong choice. In verse 10, then Jesus says, he's not gonna go up initially, not publicly, but then God sends him. And again, him waiting for the father. Verse 11, it says, uh, or there, I'm sorry, uh, he's not fickle. It's exactly the opposite. He's resolved himself to following the Lord. And here, the whole idea that his brothers had of showing himself to the world, he just flatly rejects that. Not trying to draw attention to himself. Verse 11, then the Jews, the same group again, sought him at the feast and said, where is he? Literally, it's where is that man? It's got a tone to it, right? It shows exasperation, shows some frustration with him. And so the Jews here searching for him. Based on that word, based on the tone, this was a hostile searching. They had hostile intentions against him. Wrong choice, wrong choice. They had all the evidence, all the evidence they needed. And they rejected him flatly. Eventually here we're gonna see in John 8, 48, they even said that he had a demon. Wrong choice. Verse 12, we see there was much complaining. Ganguzo again, same word. Much complaining among the people. You've got the Jews, wrong choice. The brothers, wrong choice. Now the people complaining about him, wrong choice. What were the people complaining about him? Some said he is good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. Both of those are wrong. When you come to face the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, He's not merely good. He is God Almighty in the flesh. He is perfectly holy, perfectly just, perfectly righteous. He is deity. He isn't merely good, like you would say good of some other man, some other teacher, right? Some other prophet. He's more than that. And then, no, on the contrary, the other opinion here, he deceives the people. Back in that day, the Talmud, after the, after the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, after his resurrection and ascension, they wrote in the Talmud to explain the Lord Jesus Christ away that the Lord Jesus Christ was a deceiver who practiced sorcery and who led Israel astray. That's what the Jewish Talmud says about Jesus Christ. And here, that accusation of deception already gaining a foothold. However, verse 13, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Wrong choice, wrong choice again. The authorities at that time didn't want him to discuss publicly at all. They thought that if the people were talking about him, that would make him more important in their eyes than what he needed to be, more important than what they wanted him to be. So just don't talk about this man at all. And under threat of being kicked out of the temple, kicked out of the synagogue. And so they whisper about him here. They don't speak openly. It's behind the scenes and they're complaining and grumbling. They whisper about him, wrong choice. How often today, how often in your life, if you're honest with yourself, then you can say this to your shame, to my shame, how often has a fear of man silenced our witness for the Lord Jesus Christ? That godless, wicked fear of man. We're not to be fearful of man, we're to be bold for the Lord Jesus Christ in sharing the gospel. We're to be unabashedly bold, unreserving in our witness for him. And yet here, silence was brought about because of the fear of man. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, the Bible says, don't fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Trust Christ. Don't fear their faces. Don't fear man. Don't let a fear of man keep you from being faithful in evangelism. Faithful in talking about the gospel. People need the Lord. Here again, the point, wrong time, wrong plan, wrong choice. Don't make the same wrong choices. 
Resolve in your heart, resolve in your mind who it is that you serve. And then serve him faithfully, serve him boldly, obey him. It's interesting by contrast here, you know, why did the Lord Jesus Christ go up? He says he's not gonna go up with them and then he turns around and he goes up. It's not fickle, but why ultimately did Jesus Christ go up? Think about it for a moment. God, Leviticus 23, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, gives a command. He gives a command that every male Jew pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. What if Jesus had disobeyed this command? Certainly not, right? This is not gonna happen. The Lord Jesus Christ perfectly obeys the Father and he goes up obeying the Father, Father despite the conditions against him, despite the consequences. He goes up at risk of his own hurt, but he obeys. He, he, obeys the, he obeys the Father to the point of death, even death of the cross. So certainly he's going to obey perfectly here. He goes up to, the, up to the festival because God had commanded it. It was God's plan and he was going to fulfill all righteousness. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, consider where your mind and heart is set and consider the, the wicked trappings of that and the eventual end of all that. It will mean the damnation of your soul It will mean your eternal torment. Listen to Jeremiah Burroughs. Jeremiah Burroughs says, I may say to an earthly-minded man, those thoughts, cares, affections, and endeavors that you spend on the things of this world, had they been spent on the things of God, they might have saved your soul to all eternity. Now listen, don't misinterpret him here. You might have gotten Christ, he said, in heaven and eternity. The Lord would have gone along with you and you may come to say at the great day when all things shall be opened before men angels, men and angels, had I spent those thoughts and cares and endeavors on understanding the ways and things of God and eternal life, my soul might have been saved forever. And he says, not that our works will do it, but that God would have gone along together with you in those ways. It's not a salvation by works here. The Lord says, seek the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you seek the Lord with all your heart, you'll find him. So seek the Lord. Cry out to the Lord. If you're a Christian here today, don't be earthly-minded, worldly-minded. Examine yourself. Turn from that sin and follow him faithfully, fervently. Otherwise, it may be revealed that yours isn't of a saving, your faith isn't of a saving nature. Persevere to the end and be saved. All of this in contrast with the perfect plan, the perfect timing of God who works everything, all things for his ultimate glory and for the good of his children who put faith in Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. I thank you for these examples that you give us. And God, please find us faithful not to think, not to respond, not to be unbelieving as they are but to trust the Lord, to follow the Lord, and to wait on you. God, to follow your perfect plan, your perfect timing. God, where we're unsure, to seek you, to pray to you, to cry out to you, God, for wisdom, for direction. Lord, help us to set our minds, our hearts, our very lives on things which are above. Lord, and get our heads and minds and hearts out of the filth of this world for your glory, God, and for our ultimate good. We praise you and worship you and thank you, Lord, for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.